Our guest today is a professor of chemistry at the Belgian University of Louvain. His name is Istvan Marco and he's an observer of um, climatological issues. So uh, our question is related to COP21 in Paris, the conference that ended in November. What are the results as you see them? Essentially nothing. To be fair, um, COP21 is the 21st version of these big meetings. Uh, a lot of people come in there. They were like 30,000, 40,000 people that had to be taken care of. 195 different countries were present. And essentially, these people meet there to discuss about what might happen and what kind of agreement they can come up with. It turns out that like with the previous COP, COP20 and so on in Copenhagen and so and so forth. Um, this meeting, this meeting, the COP21 meeting in Paris, actually resulted in essentially no result whatsoever. Why? Because if you read very carefully the text, there is absolutely nothing binding in this particular treaty. What happens is that none of the countries are supposed to do anything except their goodwill. So they will provide a certain number of reduction that they are expected to accomplish. But if they don't reach the expected numbers, if they don't reach the decrease in, say, greenhouse gas um, that they promised, there's absolutely nothing there that can prevent them from any bad effect. Nobody can come and tell them, look, you have to do better than that. The only argument to help countries or to push countries to fulfill their wishes or what they will put forward is essentially shame. To my knowledge, no politician knows what shame subject is shame. at all. <laughs> they are totally not subject to shame. So, you know, good wish is one thing, promises is one thing, but very, very seldom do countries fulfill their promises. Okay, so the conference was about um, global warming or, or climate change, let's say, and what they said, what they say is that they are very alarmists. They say that we need to reduce CO2. Do we need to reduce CO2 and other greenhouse gases? Well, th there's a difference between greenhouse gases in general and carbon dioxide. For me, some greenhouses have, of course, a, a very important effect. But the most important greenhouse gas is water. Water is, is really the greenhouse gas in the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide... Perhaps. Yes, carbon dioxide itself is a very, very minor greenhouse, not only in quantity, but also in its effect. It's about 10 times less efficient than water, and it's only 0.04% carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, whereas water is present in 1% to 3% in general. So CO2 is at least 500 times less efficient. Now, in addition to that, carbon dioxide is not a pollutant. Many times I hear that people are claiming carbon dioxide is a pollutant. It's not. Carbon dioxide is, in fact, food for plants. And what we can notice is that, of course, without carbon dioxide, we would not have plants because they rely on photosynthesis to generate the carbohydrates to grow and so on. Everyone who has a greenhouse knows that if you want to grow some plants better, faster, you want them to be bigger, you inject carbon dioxide. In most of the greenhouses, there is like three to four times as much CO2 as in the atmosphere. There are also a lot of studies showing that most of the actual plants living on Earth are depleted of carbon dioxide. They are hungry. They are actually starving for more carbon dioxide because previously there had been a lot more CO2 in the atmosphere and plants had to evolve because the, the amount of carbon dioxide decreased. So for the planet itself, it's good to have more carbon dioxide. Moreover, over the past 30 years or so, satellites have been monitoring the greening of the planet. And what we observe is that over this period, about 20% greening has been observed. So the more carbon dioxide, the merrier. Is global warming a reality? Yes and no. Let's put it in a different way. There is no global temperature. It has no meaning per se. There is no global climate. The Earth has not one single climate. Climate is something which is local. And the previous climatologist, 
years ago knew that very well because they talked about a, a Mediterranean climate, they talked about a desertic climate. So every different region on Earth has a different climate. So we cannot consider that the whole planet has exactly the same climate. There are some places in Earth when the temperature reaches minus 80 degrees, whereas at the same moment in time, at another part of the planet, you will have temperature reaching plus 50 degrees. So a global temperature has no physical meaning whatsoever. So I don't think we have to consider that as a whole entity per se. What we do on a local basis is important. What we are looking at a global place is very different. And we cannot just take local temperatures and transform that into something meaningless, which is called a global temperature, and even more meaningless, what is called an anomaly of temperature, which is a difference between the whole medium value of all those temperatures minus a whole medium value of a selected period of time, which by no means is something where climate has been constant for 30 years. Climate changes continuously. Okay. So uh, Europeans have the impression now that there is a, a certain warming, uh, less winter, uh, warmer winters. Is it so? It could well be, because if you think about it, and again, depending on where you are, if you think about it, we have just come out not that long ago from a cold period called the Little Ice Age, a period that started roughly around 1300 and which ended up somewhere around 1850, 1870. So after a cold period, which was not always cold, let's be fair, there was some period of warming, some period colder, some warming and so on, but this was a disastrous period. People died by millions. Um, the, the, the crops did not grow when needed. Sometimes the summer was very, very dry. Sometimes there were huge amount of rain. Sometimes the winter was so cold that the Thames was frozen over four meter depth or the Seine was completely frozen in Paris and people used to hold their merchandise there. They used to hold the market. They used to, to go, you know, skiing or, or yeah. skating on oh. the ice. So after that period of cold, what we, what we usually observe is an increase in temperature. And we are just in the leftover of that increase in temperature. We are sort of reaching the top of that period. And because climate oscillates, what happens now is that we have this plateau of nearly 20 years during which temperature has not moved. At least the anomalies of temperature have not changed. So we are reaching this plateau. This plateau is nothing else than the top of a curve. And after the top of a curve, as usually happens, you go down on the slope. So what many scientists now are claiming is that in the next few years, and certainly for the next foreseeable future, 30, 40 years, we are going to see temperatures coming down. And they relate this to the activity of the sun. There have been some very nice uh, contribution recently from a Russian and English team about understanding the way the sun works in, in, in our galaxy, in our um, environment, and how the effect of this sun impinges on the temperatures in the Earth. And what they have noticed is that for now several years, the sun has gone quiet. That means less and less activity of the sun. And clearly, the sun is the most important provider of energy for our planet. And you can clearly observe a decrease in the temperature. Meanwhile, the carbon dioxide has kept on increasing. And so this clearly indicates that there is really no correlation between the temperature we measure or we calculate and the amount of carbon dioxide released in the atmosphere. So what you say is that the next ice age could be around the corner. Well, I wouldn't call that an ice age, but certainly uh, according to a number of scientists, we are going to reach a lower temperature period. Now that may be, of course, interspersed with higher temperatures. Sometimes we will have maybe warmer summers, sometimes we will have a lot more rain, but definitely what people are now suggesting is that the temperatures globally will go down. Now we can notice already uh, these kind of things. For example, the, uh, the melting of the Arctic um, ice has slowed down since at least 10 years and has been reaching a plateau as well. It's actually quite nice to correlate what happens in the melting of the Arctic sea ice with the plateau of temperature that we are observing. And so the, the Arctic sea ice has been melting ever since we left 
the little ice age and the temperatures went up. And now what we notice is that for at least 10 years it's been on a plateau. Okay, the, the Earth has been warmer in historical times in the past. Definitely warmer. According to all the studies, what happened was that somewhere like 14,000, 10,000 years ago, we came out of the last ice age. Now, these ice ages usually last about 100,000 years, and so far there have been a number of them. So we left for some obscure reasons, no, people know why these are called the Milankovitch cycles. So we left this last Ice Age period and we entered what we call now the Holocene. The Holocene is an interglacial period, so that's a period which is warmer than the others. And this period of warm started much higher in temperature than what we know nowadays. And gradually, since the, the moment we left this um, cold period, the temperatures has been gradually coming down. We have had the Holocene optimum, we have had the Roman optimum, we also much closer to us, we had the, um, the Middle Age optimum, which was the period where the Vikings went to Greenland and the Vikings actually called it Greenland for a very specific reason and they lived there until the temperatures cooled down again and we entered the Little Ice Age. At that period, of course, they could not grow their cereals, they could not raise their cattle there, and they had to leave, and those who didn't left, of course, died over there because the, the whole thing collapsed, of course. The, the, the ice went up, the temperatures went down, they had no food, so basically they died there. So if we don't need, actually, like the climate alarmists say in Paris, if we don't need to reduce CO2, all the, um, uh, the, the talk about the new renewable energies is, is useless. It is, in the sense that what we have to do is not look after CO2. CO2 is not a culprit in any ways. The carbon dioxide, as I said, is food for plants, and without plants there would not be any life on Earth, and certainly we would not exist. So we need carbon dioxide. People tend to forget that uh, up to 70% of the oxygen we breathe come from the decomposition of carbon dioxide by small marine microorganisms called phytoplanktons. They generate that. So carbon dioxide, for me, is more like a molecule of life than anything else. Now, concerning energy, it's a different matter. Of course, we have fossil fuels, we have nuclear energy, and it's quite understandable that people want to move away from these kind of energies to something which they call renewable. Now, the only renewable energy I would agree calling renewable is hydroelectric energy or, for example, thermal energy like in, in uh, Iceland, for example. Photovoltaic uh, energy or energy produced by using windmills is certainly not renewable. It's just intermittent. That's not the same thing. If you don't have wind, you don't have electricity. If you don't have sun, you don't have electricity. So. Every time you use a windmill, every time you have to use photovoltaic cells, you of course need some backup energy generation. And these backup energy generation are essentially gas-fired power plants. And so they will have to go on and off and on and off according to the demand. And that generates even more pollution than without uh, the, the um, let's say, the windmills or the photovoltaic cells. So this is one part of the problem. The other part of the problem lies in the fact that green energy per se is living on subsidies. And if you don't have subsidies, and this is where I disagree with the way the governments are acting in the European Union and elsewhere in the world, they provide money to people to encourage the use of green energy. But this is now completely... Uh, um, modifying the, the free market itself, which is not a good thing. If it was so good, we wouldn't need these subsidies. Now, the companies know that, so they are eager to get the subsidies. That's far easier than be original, than be creative. So the moment the subsidies disappear, these companies disappear as well. And that's what we are seeing everywhere in the world. Okay, so... Um if we don't need to go over to renewable energies and if we don't need to reduce CO2, um, how do you see the future? Do you, can we hope that governments will open their eyes and realize over time that alarmists are going much too far 
I think they will gradually. Um, there are several things that, that are going to, to happen, but to, to say something about energy itself, what we should do is, of course, act in a, in a responsible, intelligent way. For example, we can use methods to avoid um, spending energy for nothing. I mean, someone said the, the, the best energy is the one you didn't use. So if you look at the houses, if you look at the common buildings, if you look at, at all those places, provided you protect them from losses, provided you, you put correct uh, surrounding inside, you will not lose your energy. You will not have to use as much energy. So decreasing the amount of energy we are using by adapting uh, the way we build the houses and so on is something very intelligent to do. Throwing money out at windmills or photovoltaic cells is definitely not an intelligent solution. This is something that is just based on green lobbies and this is based on the number of circuits which where people are actually sinking the money in, sucking the money. This is like a bonus and they don't have to worry about it. Now what will gradually happen is that research will move on and I have a lot of faith in the fact that we may end up with something gradually better. But for the foreseeable future, certainly for the next decades or so, I don't see how people can get rid of neither nuclear energy nor uh, fossil fuel itself. Professor Marco, that will be the end. Thank you very much uh, for, for this interview and uh, thank you all for watching us and uh, see you next time.